Right, would you ask Mr. Todd to come back in, please? Thank you. Right, Mr. Dodd. Thank you. Yes, sorry, do sit down, yes. <coughs> right, ready to go on? Yes, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Todd, um, can we sorry. now turn, please, to CTA uh, 11, page 90, your main report at page 90, uh, and look at paragraph 8.89 there. Now, um, one of the positive findings that you list there... Yes. Uh, under 889, it is over on page uh, 91. There's a long list of them. And on page 91, um, you will find... Uh, go to page 91. Thank you, yes. Um, in the fourth bullet point down there, you see... He, uh, one of your positives is that uh, there is consideration of disabled people. Yes, sir. Yes. Now, what was Carl Stokes's consideration that you said was a positive? Oh, you, you had a section, I think you pointed out yesterday, sir. He had upgraded, as it were, a question in the standard PAS 79 template to give disabled people their own section, which would imply that he, he was being driven by his own template to consider... Uh, disabled people. I see. So the positive was that he put a, a tick box section into his FRA template. That would force them to look at it, yes. R right. Um, but not actually addressing the substance of the TMO's arrangements under Article 97B in respect of vulnerable persons. Um, it's difficult to say what he did, but. F uh, well, quite. From his evidence, um, his evidence doesn't really support it terribly well, I didn't think. No. Well, thank you for that. Uh, that probably. C covers a number of the further questions I've got. <laughs> but let's see if we can um, f fill in that outline. Can we look at his June 2016 FRA at uh, CST 403145? Now, uh, as a general point, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong from your observations, Mr. Todd, but uh, we found in no FRAs for Grenfell Tower or any other building that uh, Mr. Stokes c carried out. Uh, any breakdown of occupants, especially at risk, as required by PAS 79 on its face. So sleeping occupants, disabled occupants, young persons. Could, could I just ask, sir, when, when you say breakdown, do you mean generically or by individual, like uh, Mrs. Smith on the fifth floor? Uh, uh, any, any identification, uh, either by number or group uh, or, or location or an individual? Uh, Have you seen any? No, uh, we haven't. I, I wouldn't normally see that in a fire risk assessment. Right. Sir. So you, you, you don't ex agree, then, that the FRA for June 2016 was deficient in not uh, providing any sort of identification uh, of occupants, especially at risk. Would you help me by letting me see the, the section? Uh, uh, yes, right. let's do that, it, of course. Page 23, section 13. Thank you. Uh, and you can see that uh, on that page, the question is, um, it is considered that the building is provided with reasonable arrangements for means of escape for disabled people, and he's ticked yes. Yes, that's right. Look, yes. Uh, and then if we go on underneath that, under comments or observations, he says this. At the time of the risk assessment, there was no evidence of any e a resident within the premises who suffers from sensory impairment that would prevent them from hearing a shouted warning of fire. TMO have introduced a comprehensive programme to gathering information about tenants, including any disabilities and their physical ability and mobility to respond to any emergency situations. This information will be inputted on a TP tracker system and held centrally. The additional information, and it goes on, the additional information will be used to assess if residents may require additional devices to provide them with early warning of smoke stroke fire in their home and or development of a personal emergency evacuation plan, PEEPs. And it goes on about lifts, and we'll come back to that later. Yes, um, sir. Now, uh, just, sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask you a question, but did you have a supplementary? Well, I mean, you... you <laughs> Uh, you have, you have, what, ask your question of me and I'll see... No, no, I was going to answer your question, sir. Right, I'm not sure I've asked a question yet. Uh, your question was, did I think that what was written in his risk assessment 
was adequate in its consideration of disabled people? I, th I thought that was your question. Uh, well, well, it was, but I think we've gone beyond it. But please, please, please answer that question. All oh, right, thank you. Um, I, I mean, if, if, if what is written there were an accurate reflection of the facts, then I would, I would say he had, he had done his job as a fire risk assessor. Um, I think, though, to be entirely objective and, and give you the whole picture, uh, having watched his evidence, I don't think his evidence actually supports what's written there. Uh, right. Um, so help me with then why you thought that him considering disabled people was a positive, if in fact he didn't go on and do what... Uh, well, be because he, it appeared that he had investigated this with the TMO and, if I can give you one of my nutshell answers, they had it under control. Right. Now, where a responsible person has committed, uh, on its face at least, looking at this as here, to preparing an emergency evacuation plan for uh, vulnerable residents, would you expect the fire risk assessor to assess the arrangements for disabled persons in the light of that commitment? Individually. Well, on, on, on the page, we've seen what's said. Yes. And would you, would you expect the fire risk assessor to pick up that page and then analyse and ask further questions uh, uh, in order to assess the arrangements? No, sir. For the purposes if, if, of assessing the risk generally? If it were correct that the TMO had gathered information and they were using it to assess if residents might require additional help because of uh, fire in their home, which uh, is probably, as I said, the most important thing, or the development of a PEEP, then I would say he had done his job as a, as a fire risk assessor by confirming that the TMO had this in, in hand. I see. Well, you can see that Mr Stokes has noted that the TMO were using a system to identify residents with disabilities. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and you can see that he notes that at the time of the fire risk assessment, there was, as he puts it, no evidence of any resident within the premises who suffers from a sensory impairment that would prevent them from hearing a shouted warning of fire. Yes. Now, given the information recorded by Carl Stokes, would you have expected him to have asked the, the TMO whether there were any residents, vulnerable residents, recorded on the TP tracker, the system he's identified, at the time that he carried out the fire risk assessment? Who, who needed additional warning because of hearing problems? Well, just to or ask more the generally. question, are there, given that you have a system, OTMO, on your TP tracker yes. system, can you please tell me whether there are vulnerable residents on that system so that I can assess the risk? Would you have expected him to do that? No, sir. Why is that? Because uh, on the face of what's written there, the, 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 the TMO were dealing with this uh, themselves and uh, should have been competent. I mean, if they were actually uh, collecting the information, uh, carrying out additional assessments themselves, which would smack almost of the PCFRAs I talked about, uh, and whether they needed anything to help them with a fire in their own home, then um, on face value, that, that's all good stuff. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't expect him to then drill down any further into it. Well, you see, he starts off this passage, as I read to you, by saying that there was no evidence of any resident within the premises who, and he goes on to say, suffers from sensory impairment, which is only one yes. subcategory of vulnerability, of course. But he says there's no evidence, uh, and then identifies a potential pot of evidence. Would you have expected the reasonable reasonably competent fire risk assessor to ask the client whether in that pot of evidence or pot of, pot of information there was any evidence of any resident with some kind of vulnerability. Now, the, way, the way I read that, sir, and I may have read it wrongly, is that within that pot of evidence there, was no, there were no uh, persons with, with a, a hearing problem. Uh, so I, I took that to be all one... Oh, I see. Do you, do you see what I mean? So you understood that he had interrogated the TP yeah. system? And, uh, well, not the, not the system. Or but been, told, the, been told that they were... Been told, exactly. I see. Oh, I see. Uh, now, um, in all of his fire risk assessments for Grenfell Tower between 2010 and 2016, 
Um, it, it is the case, take it from me, that Mr Stokes did not identify any residents, especially at risk within Grenfell Tower. He told us that at day 137, yes. page 96. Uh, now, he, he also explained that he didn't ask for, for any information about residents who were disabled at Grenfell Tower because his understanding was that it was for the responsible person to tell the fire risk assessor that information, as he put it. Now, was Mr Stokes's position, as he's explained it, one which most fire risk assessors would have taken at the time, i.e. to wait to be told by the responsible person that there were vulnerable residents, rather than demanding accurate and up-to-date information on such persons? No, it, it wouldn't. Um, uh, where, where I would stop short in agreeing with you is I, I don't think he needed information on each and every vulnerable resident. But on the face of it there, that would say to me that he had sat down uh, with a representative of the responsible person and been told, we are collecting information on vulnerable people. We're going to put it on a central system. There are no... Uh, residents who cannot hear a warning of fire, and we are actively uh, verifying whether they need additional devices in their home and or the development of a PEEP. That, that is what the English words say to me, sir. I see. So you take from his description uh, in the box that we've read uh, uh, a description of a situation whereby he had actually asked for this information and been given it. Correct. I see. Uh, now, uh, and I think you're saying that actually no, m most fire risk assessors would, would not simply have proceeded on the assumption that there was no evidence, but would actually have asked about it. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes, <clears throat> you, yes. I mean, why would, why would they are... Sorry, it's a rhetorical question, sir, but I'm, I'm just making a point. Why, why would the risk assessor assume that the RP knew to tell him this information unilaterally without being asked. Yes. Well, Mr Stokes's uh, evidence was that uh, interrogating that was beyond what he would expect a fire risk assessor to do. And I'm referring there to day 137, page 84, line 23 to 85, line 20. Interrogating the software, I would agree with. Yes. Uh, but, but simply asking the question. But you still need to ask the question. Right. And, and, and I don't really understand, and I didn't understand from his, his evidence, how he could make that statement unless he had actually asked the question, as you put it, sir. Yes, I see. Now, he accepted, uh, uh, day 137, page 123, lines 5 to 11, that in the five fire risk assessments that he conducted for Grenfell Tower between 2010 and 2016, he never identified and considered disabled residents or occupants especially at risk. Was that persistent failure over those years consistent with your expectations of what a, a reasonably competent fire risk assessor should have done or would have done? No, I think, I think probably by then it was reasonable for a risk assessor. Let's, let's, let's put it into practical terms. that The risk assessor would not have asked for details of every individual resident, but would they have said, have you any arrangements in hand for uh, giving assistance to disabled people? Whether, whether required by the fire safety order or whether just as good practice. Um, uh, and uh, I would expect them to have some high-level generic information, but, but no, no greater detail than that. Right. Uh, having been told in September 2010, at the very outset of his instructions, uh, to, to act as a fire risk assessor for the TMO in relation to its stock, uh, that they had a TP tracker system uh, on which they were tracking vulnerable persons. Would, would you have expected him, uh, every time he did a fire risk assessor, to have asked, uh, at least generically, what is on that? What does your pool of information on the tracker tell me? I think what I probably would have, uh, if he was doing a review, if I were doing the review, I would have intended to say, are you still collecting information about disabled people, and is that still the same, that you've, you've got this in hand, as it were? Right. Now, I want to look at the assessment of the emergency plan for Grenfell Tower, bearing in mind what we discussed earlier, which was that I, I think your evidence was that in a high-rise residential block, uh, a st an emergency plan need go or would go no further than a stay-put policy with the qualifications in it. Yes. Um, could, could we go to the template fire risk assessment in past 79, please, at page 90? And I'd like to look at uh, section 25 on that page, pa subsection 4. It's 
So CTA 703, page 90. Yes, uh, and at 25.4, this, this is within the template. Yes. Appropriate fire procedures in place, more specifically, and then you can say, you can see, are there procedures, etc. These are the questions. And the um, last question uh, is, are there adequate procedures for evacuation of any disabled people who are likely to be present? Yes. Now, f first, f first, more generically, you can see the section. It is... Would you expect a reasonably competent fire risk assessor to assess the arrangements for an emergency plan by reference to this list? In general terms, yes. In general terms, yes. And, and to ensure that there was a documented emergency plan recording these arrangements? There would need to be a documented emergency plan, yes, sir. And in your view, would that include each of the matters listed under paragraph 25.4 there? Uh, yes, it, it would. Um, yes, and that, yep. and that would include suitable arrangements... Uh, uh, for ensuring uh, that there were adequate procedures for evacuation of any disabled people who are likely to be present, yes? Yes, but that, that may... It could be recorded... It could have been recorded by risk assessors, and I'm just reflecting custom and practice, sir, that uh, it's a stay-put strategy, and uh, if uh, necessary... If disabled people need to be rescued, it'll be, they'll be rescued by the Fire and Rescue Service. Mm, but the state... Uh, sorry. No, go on, please. But the state put strategy is, is, a, is a procedure for not evacuating. Yes, that's true. Uh, so does this list at least not tell us that the approach of PASS, uh, at least by the informative uh, template, was that there did need to be procedures in place, adequate procedures in place for the evacuation of disabled people likely to be present. OK, so here's the problem, sir. Um, we come back to the fact that generally this is referring to blocks of flats. However imperfect that may be, I can't tell you any other than as it is. We, th this was really primarily focused on commercial premises. And we need to distinguish, sir, between evacuation and rescue because they're completely different concepts. W would it take up too much time to elaborate on that? Well, uh, if you can elaborate shortly, it won't. <laughs> can I ever, sir? Um, do your best. I'm, I certainly will, Chairman. Um, so evacuation, by definition, is something of a routine procedure followed in buildings with a simultaneous evacuation strategy. So, the f and, and a fire alarm system. So the fire alarm operates, people get out the building. I describe it as a routine procedure because the staff in a commercial building will routinely follow it during false alarms. There will be fire drills during which they routinely follow this evacuation procedure. In a block of flats with a stay put strategy, evacuation doesn't really arise because there is no fire alarm system, there is no routine procedure for everybody being turfed out of the building, if I can put it that way. So if it is necessary for people to leave their flats, uh, something's gone wrong. Something's gone quite badly wrong. Uh, these are abnormal circumstances. These are not routine circumstances. And if people cannot uh, evacuate their flats, then it becomes a rescue because it's an abnormal situation, not an evacuation. And that was my point, sir. Um, and it wasn't just a matter of semantics in the report you took me to, which I think was my first report. And I said the fire service are not a fire and evacuation service. So in commercial premises, their intervention should not be necessary. But they are a fire and rescue service. And in a block of flats, if people are having to leave the building, let's not call it evacuate, because of um, uh, failure of the structure, it's a rescue, not uh, so, evacuation. So in short, is your answer that that last uh, procedure there doesn't or doesn't really apply to a residential high-rise? I think that's, that is the point. I could have put it in that nutshell yes. better for it. Well, what about um, an individual in a flat who is disabled, yes. who manages to get themselves across their threshold into the lift lobby and is uh, therefore on the premises. Why does that last bullet point there, adequate procedures for their evacuation, not apply? From a fire in their own flat, for example. Exactly. Yes. OK. So the, uh, under the circumstances that you've described, they have just evacuated. They've evacuated their flat. 
they're now in what is effectively a refuge with a lift. Uh, and you're probably going to go on to lift, so I won't at the moment. No, I'm going to ask you the next question, which follows from your acceptance of the premise, which is that once uh, the individual is on the premises, in the lift lobby, yes. standing outside there, <coughs> do you yes. accept that the, um, the responsible person would have to have an adequate procedure for evacuating them from there to out of the building? Well, it, it's difficult to envisage what that procedure would, would be, sir, in a building with no staff. That's the problem. So is that, is that another way of saying that, in, in practical terms, uh, the response, person responsible for a high-rise block of uh, residential, residential block uh, did not, in practice, be required to have adequate procedures for evacuation of disabled people likely to be present in the communal areas? Never mind in their flats. Right. Well, it, 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 becomes, it becomes something that's quite impracticable, but they can use the lift, of course. Well, um, never mind how they got to their front door. How okay. do you know they can use the lift if they're disabled? Supposing they were um, not able to reach the... completely unsighted. Well, I suppose it begs the question how they use the building under, under normal use. Um, partially and sighted and blind people can often pick their way around buildings that they're familiar with uh, really quite well. Hmm. A, a partially or sighted person might be able to pick their way around their own flat and may have, worked, may have established a system within their own flat to be able to get out of it. But at, at the point they enter the premises, are, are you saying that the responsible person had no obligation at all to put in place adequate procedures for their evacuation from there? Well, it becomes a matter of practicability, sir. So why would it be impracticable for the TMO, being a responsible person, to put in place adequate procedures for the evacuation of one disabled person, standing, or unsighted person, standing outside their flat? in the event of a fire in their flat. I don't mean to answer a question with a question, but what would that be? That's a problem. Well, the qu I think the fact that you've asked the question of me uh, tells me that you don't know the answer. Well, I, d I don't think there is an answer, or at the time, certainly, and, and even today, uh, people haven't really got an answer to that question. Mm. Given that that question is one that arises squarely on the face of the RRO and squarely on the face of your own guidance, can you explain why it was uh, that the fire risk assessment trade was never made aware uh, of what you're telling us now, namely that these procedures do not or do not in practice or cannot in practice be applied to a residential block of flats? I think that was well understood. I've been understood prior to 2006 when blocks of flats didn't even come within fire safety legislation. And so the custom and practice, deficient though it might be, probably continued uh, in, in truth. Uh, and that is where individual uh, person-centred fire risk assessments, tailor-made for the person, comes in and that's, that, that's what community fire safety very often did. Mr Todd, forgive me for taking too simplistic an approach to this, but are you able to identify any regulation or any guidance to a fire risk assessor that tells the fire risk assessor that when it comes to disabled people, or vulnerable people, in high-rise residential blocks, there are large parts of the guidance which don't apply to them? There's not a large part of the guidance or that any applies part, to Or any part of um, the guidance which don't apply to them. Can I point to that? Well, there was a consensus of opinion in PAS 79 Part 2, but that's been temporarily withdrawn, or suspended, I should say. If, if I was a fire risk assessor, who, who, and it was my first job, or if I was a vulnerable person, sorry, a responsible person, yes. uh, embarking on my own fire assess risk assessment, <coughs> uh, what would I look at to tell me that I didn't need to trouble myself about putting in place adequate procedures for the evacuation of any disabled people who happen to be in my lift lobby? It's, it's a very hypothetical situation, sir. If, if, you, if you are a freeholder of a block of flats, there's... You don't, you don't just buy the freehold and, and learn it on the job. Well, given what you told us yesterday, which yes. was that the intention behind the, behind the, uh, the regulations, regulatory environment, was that 
building owners, responsible people, yes. would be undertaking their own fire risk assessments if possible. Uh, and it was their first time. Uh, I don't see why it's hypothetical. Um, the question is, what would they look at? What would they look up to understand that they did not need to put in place adequate procedures for the evacuation of any disabled people present in their lift lobbies, on their stairs, in their main hall? They would find difficulty in finding anything that yes. explained that. You, you mentioned means of escape for disabled people as one of the, the CLG guides. Uh, the problem is that didn't address blocks of flats. So guidance produced by government on means of escape for disabled people for the purpose of compliance with the fire safety order was silent on blocks of flats. I, I mean, it, 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 sitting there today, don't you find that all this rather a surprising debate, given that, for example, the Equality Act uh, was passed in 2010? <laughs> the, not, not terribly surprising, sir, because blocks of flats have been built in, in the built environment since, well, if you go back to the flats for artisans, so-called, go back to Victorian times, uh, and stay put had always been accepted as a strategy. And if you build a block of flats correctly, sir, then stay put is extremely favourable to disabled people. Because you mentioned the Equality Act, sir. The moment you say, I've built this block of flats, but the build quality is so poor, or the design is so poor, that stay put uh, may not work or is, is unlikely to work. The minute you say that, you can do all you can to help disabled people, but you can never make them as safe as an able-bodied person. So you've lost equality almost before you start. If you build the building correctly, then stay put is <coughs> safe for everyone and you actually have equality. Now, let's, um, let's go to the LGA guide. Uh, I want to ask you one or two questions about uh, complex buildings. Can we look, please, at the LGA guide? That's uh, HOM 0045964, page 118. Uh, and, <coughs> give me, uh, paragraph 79.1. Yes, sir. Uh, it says, um, it is a requirement of the FSO that there, that there should be an, a suitable emergency plan for the premises. Yes. Rarely, in purpose-built blocks of flats, will it be necessary to have a more elaborate emergency plan than a simple fire action notice, see Appendix 5, for examples, nor will it be universally necessary to display such notices. Indeed, it is more common not to display notices, but to convey this information to tenants in other ways, for example, through residence handbooks and so forth. That's correct, sir. And then if we go to page 120, paragraph 79.12, uh, you say this, uh, next to the, uh, the, the photograph, in large, more complex blocks of flats, it can be of great assistance to the fire and rescue service to keep plans on the premises detailing information on the layout of the building and its services. This could be helpful at the time of an incident in dealing with the emergency. Again, use of a premises information box at the main entrance is one way to achieve this. Yes. Um, w would you agree, first, that Grenfell Tower was a complex block of flats for the purposes of that paragraph? There isn't a definition of a complex block of flats, but I wouldn't have regarded it as complex, and, and, and here's the reason why. Um, the li from the fire brigade attendance point of view, and this is what it's talking about here, that could, could the fire brigade easily get disorientated uh, with multiple staircases, uh, corridors off corridors and so on, uh, and so plans would help them. The, the floor plan on every floor of the uppermost floors of Grenfell Tower simply repeated, uh, and it was a very simple layout. And there was a single staircase and a single lift. There was a smoke control system, uh, which you, you, you get in blocks of flats. But I wouldn't have called it a complex building, sir, no. You wouldn't? Not for the purpose of this paragraph, no. Uh, well, keep, let's keep keeping in mind the criteria for assessment of the emergency procedures in Pass 79 that we looked at earlier. Yes. Um, do you agree, let's see how we go, do you agree that, that uh, a, a building like Grenfell Tower would need a plan, f first of all, to ensure that procedures in the event of a fire are appropriately documented? Yes. Yes. 
uh, and for Grenfell, that would require procedures in relation to the residential pre premises as well as the non-residential premises. That's correct, premises. Sorry, yes. yes. Uh, I mean, for example, the non-residential premises wouldn't have a stay put, would they? Yeah, no, that's correct, sir. Yeah. Um, and, and it would also need, would you agree, suitable arrangements for summoning the fire and rescue service? Uh, yes, that's yes. The, 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 the public emergency call system. Exactly. And that would need to be documented about how the how they would be notified in the event of a fire. Yes, and residents should be told that you, you shouldn't assume that every resident, perhaps from overseas, knows to dial treble nine. I, so indeed. you need to tell them that the, the emergency number is treble nine or one one two. Yes, and and do you also agree that there would be or need to be arrangements to meet the fire and rescue service on arrival and provide them with relevant information, including those which are hazardous or those elements which are hazardous to firefighters? Well, in a block of flats, unless it's in the non-residential, the the uh, public are unlikely to be able to help the fire service with information about. Uh, matters that would be hazardous to firefighters, unless perhaps you have a resident who's on oxygen uh, and you'd, you'd warn the fire service about an oxygen cylinder because uh, that can, can go flying in the event of fire. Right. Um, but, and, and yes, you'd tell a resident if they have a fire in their flat, dial 999, leave the building, meet the fire service on arrival. Do you agree that for Grenfell Tower, relevant information would include information about the smoke control and ventilation system? Yes, yes, definitely. Where, where it was and how to work it? Yes, definitely. Yeah, and the lifts and how to work them? There was, nothing, there was nothing unusual about the lifts that would need, you need to tell the fire service how to work them. Right. Location of keys? Uh, keys for? Anywhere. Plant room, roof, uh, roof uh, lift motor room. Uh, if, if there probably wasn't a location for keys, the fire service will get into a room if they need to. Yeah. Location and access of, for dry, two dry risers. Uh, they would normally have this uh, on, the, uh, on the information that they, they carry themselves from their 7-2-Ds. On the mobile data terminal. The MDTs, yeah. Yes, but uh, that would be information that would have to be provided, wouldn't it, by the, by the responsible person to the... Um, the fire and rescue well, and, uh, the fire and rescue service carry out. Uh, sorry, does the inquiry know what a seven two D is? Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. So, so the fire and rescue service would would carry out their seven two Ds. They would liaise with someone at the time. They would collect the information on where the dry risers are and so on. Uh, and so they they should have that information. Would you agree also that there would need to be information about the suitable arrangements for ensuring that the premises have been evacuated if that were necessary? That's not possible in a block of flats, sir. Uh, but for the Grenfell Tower, there would need to be information about that for the non-residential. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So you'd have fire wardens in the yes. non-residential. Uh, and and uh, at least to that extent, a suitable fire assembly point. Uh, for the non-residential? Yes. But not for the residential? No, indeed. But um, um, uh, Grenfell Tower, being a mixed-use building, yes. would have to have information at least to that extent, wouldn't it? Yes, th yes. there would be that information. Uh, and, that. and also procedures for evacuation of everybody in the, re the non-residential part. Yes, that's all part of the emergency plan. You're quite correct, exactly. sir. Exactly, absolutely. And would therefore be, need to be uh, part of... Um, well, uh, it would, according to the advice at 7912 be best in the in a premises information book. If you're going to collect that and, and if you wanted it to be uh, made available to the fire service beyond that which they would get from the MDT, yeah. um, then a, a PIB would be a, an appropriate place for it. Yes, and, and uh, as the TMO had committed to prepare PEEPs, if there was a disabled person um, and a PEEP had been prepared for that person, would you agree that that would also need to be recorded? Uh, and uh, placed in the, in the premises information. That, that would be a good. Pl that would be a good place for it. Yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. And none of that information, none of that uh, list of things we've gone through, would be recorded in a fire action notice, would it? No, no, no not at all. Sir. So, so do you accept that for a building like Grenfell Tower, uh, which was mixed use, and for at least some of which, all of that data would need to be provided to the fire and rescue service? A fire action notice would not be adequate to satisfy the guidance in paragraph 25.4 of past 79 that we've just been looking at? Oh, no, no. I, I, that's, that's absolutely right. Yes. Thank you. So do you agree that Grenfell Tower needed a more elaborate emergency plan than the simple fire action notice? Oh, yeah. M many, many buildings would, sir. Yes, I see. I, but, uh, and would it be normal and accepted practice for the fire risk assessor to assess the arrangements for an emergency plan by reference 
to the list in 25.4 of past 79 that we looked at. I think you agreed earlier that... Would yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's all relevant information, sir. And, and to check that there was doc a documented emergency plan recording those arrangements. And you, would, you would have it documented for a yeah. building of that size, sir, yes. And also to check that there are adequate procedures for the evacuation of disabled people likely to be present, at least in, in the non-residential. In the non-residential, but that would be the responsibility of the RP for the, the non-residential, who would not be the, the TMO. Yeah. Le leaving aside the debate we've had about... Uh, about disabled persons likely to be present, which I don't want to go over again. But w would you agree that not doing any of those things and not keeping an emergency plan with that detail in it for Grenfell Tower uh, would fall below the, the reasonable standards of reasonable standards of competence for a fire risk assessor? Um, sorry, I thought I, <laughs> I thought at the start of the sentence you were going to say a reasonable thing for the RP. So just tell me, tell me. Well, would the would, proposition would keeping. Again. Would failure, to, would failure by the fire risk assessor to ensure that the responsible person had in place an emergency plan? Yes, you'd have to confirm there's an emergency plan. In, in, in fact, sir, that would be a part of, and I don't think you've referred to this, but, but that would be part of your Article 11 compliance, actually. So I think you agree that if a fire risk assessor did not... Uh, pick up the absence of these features in an, in, and the absence of, of an emergency plan containing those features, do you agree that that would fall below the standards of reasonable competence of a fire risk assessment? Yes, it would affect the, the, the validity of the fire risk assessment, yes. Yes. Now, um, past seven, we haven't discussed oh, yeah. that yet. But, uh, am I right in thinking that you were involved in the development of past seven? Mm, involved would be too strong a term, sir. Um, again, to save the inquiry's time, do they know how passes are produced? Well, let's, um, let's see if we can save it even, even further. BSI 6071, please. And I'll, sh I'll just show you the basis of the question. OK, thank um, you, sir. Which may speed things up. Page 13, that, that's page one of past seven, and the, the title for this... Yes don't recall it from the evidence, is Fire Risk Management System. Yes, yes, I know this, the, the, the document. Mm. And if we go to... Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you. you. You both have a... Each of you has a tendency to speak before the other's finished. I'm sorry, that's my fault, No, sir. it's not entirely your fault, Mr. No, it's partly my partly fault. Partly, Mr. I, I, I detect that it's partly my fault. <laughs> I think possibly if you could slow the pace down a bit and leave a bit more air between question and yes. answer and the next question, we'd all get on better. OK, yes. sir, with a, with a further apology to the, the no, shorthand transcript. No, no, that's right, but it's a difficult job doing uh, the shorthand uh, transcript, and uh, we need to make it as easy for the transcriber as we can. Yes. Yeah, on your game, Mr. Willett. Yes, PAS 79, page 5, if we go to that, please. You said PAS 79, sir, did you seven. mean PAS 7? You're quite right. I was too busy licking my wounds. Uh, if we go to page five, yes. you'll see that there is a foreword. Yes. 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 And the second paragraph contains some bullet points. And it says, uh, acknowledgement is given to the following organizations involved in the development of this specification as members of the steering group. And then the third bullet point down identifies CS Todd and Associates Limited as one of those organizations. Yes. That's correct, sir, yes. Yes. So um, we can take it, can we, from that, that uh, to some extent, it may, may not matter very much, uh, your organisation was involved in the development of PAS 7. Am I right in thinking that one of the key pieces of legislation with which PAS 7 was concerned was the FSO? Yes, that's correct, sir. And if we go to page 39 of this document, you'll find Annex G, a model pro forma, emergency planning uh, inf uh, document. It's a template, it appears. Uh, and Annex G is said to be informative. Yes. Uh, and that, am I right, sets out the suggested information required for an emergency plan for a building. Yes, that's right, sir. Yes. Uh, and uh, it says in the first main box under contents, reason for amendment, this procedure forms the basis of the organization's policy and strategy for carrying out the duty of emergency planning. Uh, do you agree 
that this format for the emergency plan for Grenfell Tower could have been appropriate? Um, I need to. I haven't looked at this for some years, sir. Would, would you mind if I took a moment to look at no, it? No, of course. We, I mean, by all means, to look at. If we scroll down slowly, we can look at this page thirty-nine and onto page forty. Yes, if we could scroll further, please. Scroll down to page thirty, put a f to forty, and then on. Uh, I think there's nothing beyond page forty. Ah, because we go to annex. Yes, it, uh, it's it's fairly broad and and yes. applicable to. Yes. And if you look at some of the headings, uh, item three is responsibility. We need to go up page 39. Uh, item seven, fire attack plan. That's the very bottom of your screen. And then over the page, item eight, liaison and communication with the fire and rescue service. And then lower down, 11, contingency plan. 12 emergency planning audits, 13 management review. Now, now my question was, do you, do you agree uh, that, that this format for an emergency plan could have been used for Grenfell Tower? Yes, I think you'd want more information, actually, than that. But um, hmm. the, the headings are, are broad enough. I suppose you could key most information into it, but it's probably not quite enough. Right. That answers my next question. Thank you. Uh, and what else would you expect to see or want to see in an emergency plan based on this template? Well, you very helpfully went through a, a list of things, sir, uh, which wouldn't all just fit very neatly into those headings. So uh, you, you, you'd want to, um, you really need, you see, to, to meet Article 11, sir, you, you are supposed to have uh, a record of the fire safety arrangements Unfortunately, Article 11 is written as gobbledygook, so people tend not to understand it. But if I could translate my interpretation of it, mindful that final interpretation of legislation is the role of the chairman or a court. Indeed. Uh, the, the, the simple version is there should be a building fire manual that describes all the fire precautions, that little thumbnail sketch of the fire precautions. So the things you told me about, sir, or you put to me, the smoke control, the dry rising main, and so on. Uh, and and they, they don't really all fit into that, really. Yes, thank you. Um, can we then turn to a new topic, which is Carl Stakes' assessment of the emergency plan for Grenfell Tower? Uh, if we go, please, first to CST 403145, uh, this is Mr. Stokes' FRA from June 2016, and, and I'd like to go in that, please, to page five at the bottom, uh, where you can see there is a heading, Evacuation Strategy for this Building. And he says this, For the residents of this building, there is a stay-put evacuation strategy. This means the residents can remain within their own dwelling during a fire incident in this building unless the fire is in their dwelling or that their dwelling is otherwise affected by the fire in which case they should immediately evacuate their dwelling and call the fire and rescue service. The fire service or TMO employees will call, will arrange for a general evacuation of the whole building at any time if this is appropriate to do so. Alternatively, the resident can leave their dwelling at any time if they wish to do so. TMO has provided information to all residents in tenants' handbooks via letters and briefing sheets of I'm what sorry, to you, do. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. You've, you've run ahead of what's on the screen. I, I, I know. Um, I'm just hoping that we might turn the page we have now. Right, we, have. we look at the first paragraph. TMO has provided information to all residents and tenants' handbooks via letters and briefing sheets of what to do in the event of an emergency, and articles on fire safety advice and emergency procedures are included in the residents' magazine called Link. You see that? Yes, sir. And it goes on. Uh, articles are provided reminding tenants that they mustn't store items, etc., uh, uh, and then there's, uh, it goes on about languages uh, and cooking and burnt toast, things like that, lower down. And then uh, underneath that, uh, for other areas of this building, the contractors will have an evacuation policy and procedure for a fire incident within the areas under their control. The actions that they will take have been provided to the TMO. The nursery and boxing club will provide their own fire risk assessments, FRAs, and copy of these will be Copies of these will be asked for by the TMO. The evacuation procedures for these areas will be as per the occupiers' FRAs. Please see the significant finding sheets for more information on this issue. 
Now, we don't need to go to Mr. Stokes's transcript, but he told us that this section of his FRA would contain the specific evacuation strategy for Grenfell Tower in two parts, one for residential and one for commercial or retail areas. Uh, would you accept that Carl Stokes doesn't, uh, for either part of the building, refer to a building-specific documented emergency plan anywhere here? No, he, he restricts himself to the evacuation uh, procedures. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't. He, he, he talks about storing items and so on. Um, but uh, generally, it looks as though he's wrapped up a few little things in, in, into one section, but generally he's talking about evacuation, isn't he? Yes. And uh, do you accept that he doesn't say how the Fire and Rescue Service will access information about fire protection systems at Grenfell Tower in the event of an emergency? Uh, no, he doesn't. Well, he doesn't there anyway. He doesn't there. I don't know if he does anywhere else. Uh, and notes that the TMO staff would arrange for a general evacuation of Grenfell Tower if necessary. Yes. Yes. Now, um, the things that he omitted, would you agree that those are material omissions in his assessment of the emergency plan? Um, they, they could and they should have been wrapped up possibly into one question or topic for consideration, uh, namely, is there, a, is there a building fire manual, uh, which are very rarely found, I have to say, but strictly my interpretation of Article 11 is that they're required, but they're very, they're very rare. Now... Can we go, please, to your main report again and, and go to page 98? Yes. At the foot of the page, you can see that you say, under paragraph 9.8, in short, in my opinion, Mr. Stokes's FRAs conformed to the very simplistic approach to FRAs set out in the CLG guide. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong paragraph. 9.6. I'm, I'm, uh, you say there, with regard to step four, Mr. Stokes' FRAs recorded the significant findings of the FRAs and set out an action plan. It was not the role of Mr. Stokes as the fire risk assessor to prepare an emergency plan, inform and instruct people, cooperate and coordinate with others, or to provide training. However, these matters were appropriately considered in his FRAs. Now, just looking at that last sentence there, do you still consider Carl Stokes' assessment of the emergency plan for Grenfell Tower to be um, suitable and sufficient, given the at least two emissions that you've agreed? Um, it wasn't his role to prepare an emergency plan, so that, that is correct. Um, he does deal with informing and, and, and instructing people, cooperating and coordinating. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't wrap that up. You're right. He doesn't wrap that up into uh, confirming that there is a building fire manual or emergency plan. And he, re he really, in a council of perfection, he'd certainly do that. Well, it, 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 is it not a bit more than a council of perfection? Do those omissions, in your opinion, m make uh, his assessment of the emergency plan for Grenfell Tower insufficient or unsuitable? Um, I'd quite like to see the risk assessment again. If I may, just, uh, just, just do, I can, before I, can, I, can I can help you with that. They, that, when you say risk assessment, do you mean that part of the? Well, the, uh, could, could we have a, just a quick walk through the risk assessment? Uh, we because the information may be dispersed. That's the point. I see. Um, when you say when you say the risk assessment, you mean the FRA as a whole? Yes. Uh, uh, oh, I see. Uh, well, let's go to it. It's CST four zero three one four five. I took you to page five. Yes, with apologies again to, to delay, but... No, no I, I took you to page five. Um, I, I, is there any part of the FRA you'd like me to take you to? I'd, I'd just like a quick walk through it. OK, well, let's start at page one. Um, so that's scope, that's fine. Page two. Uh, forget that. And that. Well, let, let's just scroll through, and I'll, I'll wait for you to have a look, see what else yeah, th we need. Thank you. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah, I mean, he, you see, 
he, he has provided some of the relevant information himself. Uh, so, um, no high voltage luminous tubes, for example, which uh, firefighters need to know about, the access arrangements. Um, uh, LFB have visited the site, that, that's irrelevant probably. Can, can we just carry on, sir? Yes, of course. Yes, and that's the strategy, the evacuation strategy we looked at. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And where do we go then? Yeah, this is page 11. Yes, can we just carry on? Yes, I don't need to see the fire prevention bit. Right. So we can move fairly quickly through the hazards and the sources okay. of ignition. Can we, can we move, I think, to page... 22 or 23, which I think is the last page of the... Perhaps we should go back. I may have missed something. <coughs> there. Yes. Uh, yes, so we go into fire protection measures. Yes. Could, could, we, could we just carry on through that? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Can we carry on? I just wanted to see if he had a question about uh, when it comes to the management, because uh, the PAS 79 template would drive you to look at the records of fire safety arrangements. Yeah, could we carry on? Yes. Oh, sorry, can we just go back to that one? Back one page. Thank you. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. I'll retain our appropriate procedures. Procedures. Yeah, you see, he's, he's recording some of the information himself uh, in the risk assessment, but you're right, he doesn't seem to have um, asked or recorded whether their, that information was assembled into uh, a specific document. Can we just carry on? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think we're, we're into just definitions and so on, aren't we, sir? I think so. Yeah, I don't think we need to trouble anyone with looking at the, the rest of it. Yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't uh, asked whether, or he hasn't, certainly hasn't recorded whether they do have uh, a document that brings all the information together. As I, as I thought, he has dispersed quite a lot of the information himself throughout his risk assessment. Uh, but he hasn't actually uh, checked whether, or, or sorry, I should say recorded whether uh, someone has assembled that into a single document that is held by the TMO. Yes. And if we then, in the light of all of that and your review while sitting there of, of this risk assessment, if we can go back then to your main report at page 98, 
paragraph 9.6, which we were looking at before, uh, you, where you say in the last sentence, uh, these matters were appropriately considered in his FRAs, these matters including the emergency plan. Do you still consider that Carl Stokes's assessment of the emergency plan, such as there was for Grenfell Tower, uh, was appropriately considered? Yes, I think I... When I said these matters were properly considered, I, I was con really concentrating on inform, instruct, incorporate, and coordinate training and so on. Right. Uh, he hasn't. There, there is no reference as such to uh, a, uh, a holistic emergency plan. You're quite right. No, thank you. Uh, so just to be very clear, you're not of the opinion that he appropriately considered an emergency, the emergency plan. He doesn't. He doesn't appear to have verified that there is a documented. Uh, record of, of the emergency plan or, or a building fire manual or a record of the fire safety arrangements, call it what you will. Thank you. And w would that omission mean that his FRA was not suitable and sufficient? I think it's a moot point, sir. Is it a moot point? I, th I think it is. In what way moot? Um, well, does it, does it actually... It, 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 may impact, arguably, on compliance with the fire safety order, and that's the purpose of the, the risk assessment. So uh, it's, it's probably a deficiency, uh, certainly. Um, I would certainly go that far now, now that we've, we've analysed it in the way you just have. Hmm. Uh, does that make it not suitable and sufficient? I, th I just think it's, it depends on your definition of suitable and sufficient. <laughs> The, the problem with that answer, Mr. Todd, is that it is a protean expression filled in by the judgment of the trade. Would the trade, the fire risk assessment trade, have regarded Mr. Stokes's fire risk assessment for Grenfell Tower uh, it, it, with the def deficiency you've identified as uh, not falling, suitable and falling short of suitable and sufficient? Sorry. Uh, I think it's probably a matter for the, the chairman or the chairman to decide based on the evidence he's heard before him. But what I would say is we see lots of fire risk assessments that do not have any verification that there is a building fire plan and, and people tend uh, to abbreviate that into, into the fire procedures. Uh, and I don't think that's quite right, if I'm honest. Right. Um, I, I'll, I'll have to consider whether that is quite enough for my purposes, but... <laughs> Let's let's continue. Can I ask some questions now about lifts? Uh, oh, yes. Now, um, can we start here with Mr. Stakes's understanding of firefighting lifts? Can we start with um, your main report, please, at page sixteen? I can give you a nutshell answer. Well, I haven't asked the question. Oh, yet. Now that you have, but when, when I when I do, I'd be grateful for that. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, let's look at par paragraph two point fifty eight of your report at the very foot of the page, and you say here. Um, uh, it's relevant to note that Mr Stokes's FRAs contain an error in relation to the lifts at Grenfell Tower and, in all probability, all other lifts in high-rise blocks within the TMO-managed estate. Yes, sir. He advised that the lifts were firefighting stroke evacuation lifts, which is certainly in the case of the lifts at Grenfell Tower, was not correct. Yes. Now, um, uh, it... it, it is that because, uh, and I'm trying to give you a nutshell question, is that because the absence of the escape hatch and dual supply meant that they could not have conformed to the standards of a firefighting lift in accordance with BS 5588, 2000 and f number 5 of 2004, and BS EN 8172? I regret to say, sir, it's worse than that. In what uh, way? Well, the nutshell answer is I don't think he understood what a firefighting lift was. <laughs> um, that was my impression from... The fire risk assessments, uh, it was amplified by my reading of his witness statements and uh, having listened to his evidence, well, the chairman told me not to be diplomatic or beat around the bush. He still doesn't understand what a firefighting lift is to this day. Mm. And, and how would you characterise uh, that um, deficiency? I would characterise it as him being an extremely good company, including probably quite a lot of fire risk assessors and an awful lot of people in the fire and rescue service. Does that mean that quite a lot of the, the fire risk assessment trade fell short of 
the reasonable standards of competence in this respect. No, they just didn't understand firefighting lifts. Well, does that not tell us that they, a large number of them fell short of re standards of reasonable competence? No, sir. If you want to take me again to the competence standard, you'll not find anything about firefighting lifts in it. Indeed, that, that may be true. Um, but would so you it's not a required competence. Would, would you expect a reasonably competent fire risk assessor uh, to have no understanding or a misunderstanding of what a firefighter lift, firefighting lift was? Unfortunately, that would be true of, of many people. And, and um, it's because of the... Com I think you've heard evidence about lifts. Uh, there, there is huge confusion about firemen's lifts, sometimes also called fire lifts, because people don't like to use politically incorrect language and they'd be better to do so because introducing a new term, fire lifts, instead of fireman's lifts, just adds to the confusion. Then there's firefighting lifts. Then there's firefighters' lifts. Then there's evacuation lifts. And if I can, if it might help the chairman, sir, such is the confusion on the part of particularly operational crews that I'm commissioned at the moment to write a new guide for fire and rescue service operational crews that will contain telltale signs. And there are telltale signs, but they're subtle. Telltale signs so that a crew rolling up to a job can tell which type of lift they've got. But in order to explain that, I have to actually explain what the different types of lift are because crews don't fully understand that. Uh, and it's worse than that. They don't understand the operation quite commonly misunderstand the operation and the facilities of a firefighting lift. So they get stuck in the lift because of the peekaboo facility. Mm. Um, telltale sign. Yes. Uh, you say in your report, your main report at paragraph 8.66, I don't think there's a need to go to it, that Mr Stokes had missed a telltale sign that the lifts at Grenfell Tower were not firefighting lifts due to the absence of an escape hatch. Yes. Would you expect the reasonably competent fire risk assessor to know that the absence of an escape hatch meant that the lifts could not be described as firefighting lifts in his fire risk assessment? Absolutely not. I thought you did very well to actually spot that the hatch wasn't there. Unfortunately, he misunderstood the implications of it. But I thought he did well to spot that it wasn't there because I would say the majority of fire risk assessors would not take any heed of the fact that there was no escape hatch in a lift. Right. So, m missing this telltale, when you call it a telltale sign, who was it telling the tale to? Anybody who could roll up. Well, you say it's a telltale sign. It sounds as if what you're saying is that it wouldn't be a telltale sign to the reasonably competent fire risk assessor, or would it? Uh, no, a, a lot of fire risk assessors wouldn't recognise that the, the escape hatch <laughs> would, would mean that it wasn't, it, it was probably to be as 2655 or an early version of 5655. Sorry, do these standards compute, as it were? And I'm just trying to understand, you see, what... Have you heard about what, 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 what? Yeah, we've had, we've had some evidence. Thank you. <coughs> Let, let's see if we can do it by reference to your report. Thank you, you, can you go sir. go to page 85 in your report, please. Uh, and let's look together at uh, paragraph 8.62. Yes. Uh, and you start by saying that Mr Stokes did have some knowledge of the requirements of modern firefighting lift standards. Yes. Uh, and then you go on to say uh, he identified in his FRA that the lift cars at Grenfell Tower were not provided with an escape hatch for use by firefighters trapped in the lift. Correct. Uh, and then you go on to say at the, the end of that paragraph, uh, well, accordingly, while in my opinion many fire risk assessors would have overlooked or at least considered it unnecessary to comment on the absence of the trapdoor, this absence and Mr Stokes' awareness of its absence presented Mr Stokes with something of a telltale sign that the lifts were not firefighting lifts, though this omission was probably of no major concern to the LFB. Yes. Now, I, I'm interested in what you mean by telltale sign. Right. So, so is that, my question is, is that a telltale sign to the reasonably competent fire risk assessor, so that the reasonably competent fire risk assessor would see the absence of a trapdoor and know that it wasn't a firefighting lift? No. No, sir. Why is that? <laughs> because uh, 
the, the design of the lifts is outside the scope of the fire safety order. So the fire safety order requires under Article 38 that facilities provided for use by or the safety of firefighters uh, is maintained. But the fire safety order doesn't require the lifts in the first place. That's a matter for building regulations. And all the order requires is that that which is there is properly tested and maintained. So um, there, there's no great criticism of fire risk assessors that they wouldn't necessarily know some of the telltale signs. I see. You then go on at paragraph 8.63 to say, and I'm summarising here, that you didn't, he didn't correct his description of the lifts as firefighting stroke evacuation lifts when he was subsequently provided with information which expressly told him that none of the TMOs lift in their stock were firefighting or evacuation lifts. Now, do you accept, I'm assuming you do, but tell me, do you accept that Mr Stokes was wrong to continue to refer to the lifts at Grenfell Tower as firefighting lifts following that information? Yes, he was. Well, provided he accepted what, I'm not sure how you pronounce the gentleman's Kalarn. name. Thank you. If provided he accepted what Mr. Killarn said, then then clearly he was. Um, he just didn't seem to. It just didn't seem to get it. No, and is, is not seeming to get it consistent with what a reasonably competent fire risk assessor would do, having been given the information. Um, we come back to the fact that he was in total confusion about that. Uh, it's not part of the competence standard. Uh, it was a bit dogged and stubborn to continue to refer to them as that, having been told by a lift expert that they actually weren't. Uh, and I think it was incumbent on him to, to find out why. And, and, and when I tried to follow that, the, the trail went cold, as it were, uh, and it seemed to end with Janice Ray saying, see if I can remember the words, I'll ask him. And, and I don't know, sir, if the legal team managed to follow that trail any further, but I was unable to. Um, let's look at past 79. Can we please go to past 79 at page 48? Yes. And uh, let's look at uh, that page, and uh, on that page, little Roman 3. And this is under the heading uh, Other Fire Protection Systems. Uh, and it says, Other fire protection facilities and systems that should be taken into account in the fire risk assessment include A, smoke control systems, B, other localised fire suppression systems, C, dry, dry fire mains, wet fire mains, firefighting lifts. Yes. So you can see that firefighting lifts uh, is something that ought to be taken into account by the fire risk assessor. Yes, because you'd have to check their <laughs> testing and maintenance, you see. Well, that, that's right. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, at, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, recommendations under 15.1, um, you, can, you can see, although there's no express reference to lifts there, other relevant fire protection systems and equipment, and that would include firefighting lifts, I assume, wouldn't it, if there were firefighting lifts present? W would it be possible to scroll the, the document, sir? I think you're yes, reading a bit that I've one. not got. Uh, if you look at G. Thank you. I'm so sorry, you're quite right, it wasn't on your screen. Other relevant fire protection systems and equipment? I think, uh, I think it's H that's more relevant, sir. M maintenance of facilities to assist firefighters. Yes, very well. Uh, very well, that would include... So, so looking at that, it look, is this wrong? But it looks as if PAS 79 is directing the fire risk assessor to looking at the lifts to determine whether they are firefighting lifts or lifts that are facilities to assist firefighters? There isn't any difference. A firefighting... <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> a lift intended for use by the Fire and Rescue Service, if we can call it that, is a facility to assist firefighters I, I, and needs I, I, to be maintained. Indeed, and therefore, uh, that simplifies the point, In, and therefore do you, do you accept that PAS 79 is telling the fire risk assessor to look at the lift and know whether it's a firefighting lift or not? Well, is, is that what it's asking, or is it asking the fire risk assessor to check that the lift, whatever it is, has been properly maintained? Spot on, Chairman. Thank you. But you won't know whether it's been properly maintained or not, would you, unless you know what you're looking at? 
uh, you would know whether it was, to take the chairman's point, which was, was as I said, spot on, um, you would know that you were looking at, and I'm going to use a generic term that doesn't really exist, uh, a, a lift f for use by the fire and rescue service. You know it's one of those because you, you, the, the facility to ground the lift, the, the firefighter switch, would, would kind of hit you in the face um, as soon as you looked at the, the lifts at ground level or fire service entrance level. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering why we're, we're looking at maintenance, because this sits in the section of Pass 79 to do with assessment, uh, and this is about assessing the fire risk. And I'm just wondering whether looking at the express reference to firefighting lifts within Roman, I think it's L2, looks like little Roman 3, but it is in fact 52 uh, on the left-hand side, which I think we need to scroll back up for, please, to see again. Yes, no, it's just about there, sir. Just about there. You know, my, my question was really just whether or not it, it is really reasonable to, 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 to forgive a risk, fire risk assessor for not knowing whether what he's looking at is or is not a firefighting lift. Uh, I would certainly forgive them, sir, yes. Even though, in fact, it's something referred to as something to be assessed within Clause 15 of Pass 79. Yes, I think we, we've, we've called them firefighting lifts and, and probably fallen into the trap of using a term that applies to lifts installed to uh, BS uh, uh, 5588 Part 5. And, and we all tend to... The problem is, is the, the confusion of terminology, sir. We, we, anyone brought up uh, post-1986 will call them firefighting lifts. But in actual fact, lifts intended for use by the fire service prior to 1986 were firemen's lifts. Hmm. When uh, you, sorry, sorry, sorry carry No, on. please. When you sat down to... Uh, revised past 79 yes. uh, in 2012 or thereabouts. D d were you aware of this potential confusion? No, I, I, I don't actually think I was, sir. Um, I'm certainly aware of it now because we see so much confusion. Um, if I take myself back to 2012, I mean, I knew the difference, but that's just because I'm old. Um, I'm not sure I was aware that there was that much confusion or that it was that much of an issue. When did you first discover uh, that a, a large number, if not the majority, of per people practicing in the trade of fire risk assessments uh, c could not uh, identify a firefighting lift and distinguish it, it from a fireman's lift or fire lift or any other kind of lift? I don't know there was a particular day um, I found out that fire and rescue services were not familiar with this. I think the first time I became aware of that was uh, when a fire and rescue service contacted me and asked me if I knew how a firefighting lift worked. Uh, because they, they asked how, how the, the, um, the switches <coughs> in the lifts were meant to work, and they described... Uh, what I would call a peekaboo facility, and they said, is that, is that right? When you take your finger off the button, should the lift doors close, if they're, they're reverse, in other words? Uh, and I was very surprised they didn't know. Uh, and since then, and by the way, since Grenfell Tower, we have had an incident in a high-rise block of flats where firefighters perceived they were trapped in the lift, and they weren't. It was just they kept pressing the button and taking their finger off it. Um, and they complained that the lift was faulty and required our client to get a lift engineer out the same evening, only to be told you just didn't understand how to use the lift. Um, can we look at page 86 of your main report? Yes. And look at paragraph 8.68. You say, I do acknowledge that because Mr Stokes believed that the lifts at Grenfell Tower were firefighting lifts, he did incorrectly assume that they would satisfy the requirements for evacuation lifts, which are lifts designed to be suitable for the evacuation of disabled people in the event of fire, but are usually found in commercial buildings rather than blocks of flats where no evacuation lift operator is normally available. That's correct, sir. 
Yes. W- w- was that belief that you've identified there a significant error? Um, much less than you might think, sir. Um, and the reason is that uh, the TMO never had any intention of sending people to uh, evacuate residents via the lifts. That's one reason. Uh, the second, <coughs> excuse me, the second reason is that in practice you don't get evacuation lifts in blocks of flats anyway. And the reason it's perhaps one of the most important reasons that it's not as significant as you might think at first sight is that if a resident leaves their flat because there is a fire in their flat, they can actually use a standard passenger lift to leave the building. Now that sounds wrong because we tell people don't use the lifts in the event of fire, sir. Uh, But indeed, it was the Fire Brigade Union that pointed this out to us when we were drafting the LGA guide uh, because um, we... we, uh, And it was a very good point, and it was actually by a very, very good fire engineer that was the the fire safety advisor to to the FBU. Uh, And we had, almost without thinking, followed the mantra uh, in writing the fire procedures bit of the LGA guide, uh, tell residents not to use the lift in the event of fire. And the FBU's point, which was very well thought out and articulated, was this. Uh, In a block of flats, the lifts don't ground when there's a fire until the fire and rescue service get there. So, and the fire and rescue service have not got there at the point that the resident leaves their flat. They've only just left their flat because there's a fire. And their point was, other residents will be going up and down the lift normally because it hasn't grounded, nothing's happened to it. There's nothing to make it happen when there's a fire in a resident's flat. So other residents are going up and down in the lift, and you're telling this resident who has a fire in their flat that they've got to go down 20 floors down a stairway. Why should they not use the lift alongside every other resident in the block? It's a very subtle point, and taking it, we took it a bit further thinking about it. Um, Why do you tell people not to use the lifts in the event of fire? Because the lift might affect the power supply of the lift, and the benefit of a firefighting lift is it has two power supplies. Uh, independently rooted and so on. When the fire is still within the resident's flat, it's contained within a one-hour fire-resisting box with a 30-minute door. So there is no way that that fire can affect the power supply to a lift, whatever type it be. And the FBU said, why can't you let residents use the lift if there's a fire in their flat? And so we we deleted the, the little bit that said... Uh, to the resident, if there's a fire in your flat, do not use the lift. Uh, Mr. Sagan, uh, Mr. Todd, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I listen quite carefully to that, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure I really I, I either got or understood. And oh, I'm sorry. To my question, I'm sure it's my fault. But my question is really about the significance of Mr. Stokes's incorrect belief that the lifts were firefighting lifts. Uh, and you said, uh, well, I asked you whether that belief was a significant error. Yes. Uh, I mean, is it or isn't it a significant error? Uh, yeah, well, sorry. <laughs> the short answer is no. No. But I was trying to explain why, because it's counterintuitive. I, I, I think I understand that. G- given the consequences, namely that the Fire and Rescue Service might have planned to use the lift for, self, for safe evacuation when, in fact, they couldn't do so, my question is why Mr Stokes's belief was not a material error that rendered his fire risk assessment... Um, unsuitable and insufficient? Well, it would. my point was about the implications of the error and the implications of the error in relation to a resident escaping their flat. I just went on, uh, I just explained. As far as the Fire and Rescue Service are concerned, um, I, I know that you have heard or are about to hear evidence that the Fire and Rescue Service don't use firemen's lift to, lifts to transport their personnel. That, that's not correct, sir, with all due respect. London is awash with buildings that have firemen's lifts, and the crews on arrival, as we've just discussed, 
wouldn't really necessarily know what type of lift they were unless they'd picked it up from a 7.2D, but they would decide for themselves whether to use the lift under a dynamic risk assessment. And I would say, statistically, probably a day does not go past without a fire and rescue service somewhere in the country using a fireman's lift. Mr Chairman, I've got really two wrap-up questions on this topic. May I take those before yes, of the course. break? Um, Mr. Todd, if a fire risk assessor says in his fire risk assessment that the lifts are firefighting lifts and can be safely used as such when in fact they can't, why is that not incompetent advice? Um, it's, it's incorrect advice, uh, but he wasn't really required to advise on the lifts as part of the, the fire safety order. His requirement was to look at their testing and maintenance, but he should have, he certainly should have uh, taken heed of what Mr. Killarn had to say. Uh, and for accuracy in his risk assessment, he should have followed the point up. Why he didn't, I suspect, was he, he uh, didn't know what a fireman's lift was because he advised Claire Williams that it was a, a method of lifting people. I, I, where do you draw the line between incorrect advice and incompetent advice? Um, <laughs> we're into semantics again. Uh, I, I, I probably would accept that it, it's incompetent in relation to the issue of lifts, yeah. but the issue of the type of lift was not that significant in terms of the fire risk assessment, was my point. Yes, Mr. Mr. Todd, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Good point, that, Mr. Millett. It's a very good point. Right. We'll have the afternoon break now, Mr. Todd. We'll come back at 20 to 4, please. And thank you, sir. Usual request, please don't speak to anyone about your evidence when you're out of the room. Of course, sir. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 20 to 4, please. Thank you.
would you ask Mr Todd to come back in, please? <coughs> Right, Mr. Todd. Thank you. Yes, please sit down and uh, be ready to carry on. Of course, sir. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Willett. Yes. Um, yes, Mr. Todd. Can I now ask you some questions about the testing of the firefighter switch? Yes. Um, can we look at the template for the FRA at past 79 at uh, page 94? Yes. And uh, I want to ask you about item 27.7. .7. Is that routine testing, sir? Uh, it's weekly and monthly testing, yes. six monthly inspection and annual testing mm -hmm. from recollection. Uh, and uh, I think I'm right. Yes. If you look at the box at the bottom, weekly and monthly testing, six monthly inspection and annual testing of firefighter, firefighting lifts. Um, now, um, can we please look at Mr. Stokes's April 2016 FRA at the same time so that they're side by side with this document? Uh, CST 403161 at page 31. Now, um, yes, thank you very much. Now, yes. uh, if you um, look at the corresponding checkbox that corresponds with item 27.7 .7 on the left-hand side of your screen, yes. you'll see uh, that the, the corresponding checkbox uh, in Mr. Stokes's pro forma was the fourth checkbox row down monthly inspections of switches and annual testing of the firefighting stroke evacuation lifts with records kept. You see that? Yes, sir, I do. Now, you've picked up this divergence uh, yes. in your main report at page 89. Um, and and uh, I think I can just summarise that at paragraph 8.80. But We can go to it if you like, but let me see if I can summarise it accurately. You say, I think that the Stokes template contains no weekly or even monthly testing of the lifts only annual and only monthly inspection of the switches. Now, does Mr. Stokes's pro forma assess the relevant risk by reference to a less rigorous standard than that provided in the past 79 template? Yes, sir, that's correct. It does. Uh, and now let's then go to your main report at page 89, yes. paragraph 881. Take those documents off the page, off the screen, 881, you say this. I'm unclear as to why Mr. Stokes omitted any reference to weekly testing. It might be that he considered that this frequency of testing was somewhat impracticable and unnecessary in the case of a block of flats as opposed to a commercial building, in which case I would agree with his view. Weekly testing is included in the past 79 template simply because it is recommended in other standards. That last part I just want to examine with you. Yes, By sir. other standards, do you mean... Or do you include the LGA guide? <laughs> um, it, it would be correct to say uh, that the LGA guide calls up lift standards, but I, that's not what I actually meant. Uh, it, I meant um, the uh, uh, I meant the uh, other standards that deal with maintenance and, and testing of, of lifts. So, um, pushy standards. Yeah, exactly. I see. Uh, right. But let's just look at the LGA guide, which was the premise of my question, and see if, see if um, I'm wrong to, wrong to ask you about it. Could we go to that? Uh, HOM 30 45964, page 125, paragraph 81.26. And, and you can see under firefighting lifts, it says, lifts used for firefighting need to be subject to tests and maintenance on a regular basis. Uh, this will involve weekly operation of override switches and monthly inspections and annual testing and maintenance of the lifts. Yes. And that, I think that's consistent, isn't it, with past 79? That's correct, sir. Yes. Uh, so, so we can make that link at least, can't we? That's right. And they have a common source. Uh, and the common source is? The British Standard. Right. Now... Um, if weekly testing of, li of the lift override switches or switch is recommended by uh, other standards, such as the LGA guide and perhaps underlying BSI, and by PASS 79 itself by inclusion into the, in the template, yes. 
um, w was not the fact that Mr. Stokes was assessing blocks of flats w w was uh, no basis at all for excluding it or changing it? The, the problem is that the British standard is uh, unduly onerous in asking for weekly testing, in my opinion, as an engineer, sir. Uh, the switch, uh, all, all, all you're doing is just putting more wear and tear on the switch. Uh, the, the switch is unlikely to fail over a period of one month, and therefore a much more pragmatic period for testing would be one month. Now, could, could I make some supplementary comments on that, if I may, sir? Yes, of course. Um, if it's a principle in standards writing, and a, a very good analogy is testing your smoke alarm at home, sir. Um, for a long time, the guidance was test your smoke alarm every week. Uh, I don't suppose you did test your smoke alarm every week, sir, and I won't ask you that, but nobody did. Uh, and instead of saying, well, the guidance is every week, but I'm going to do it every month, it's a strange phenomenon, but if you ask people to do something too often, instead of doing it less frequency, frequently, they don't do it at all. And in recognition of that, the, the guidance is now test your smoke alarm every month, because there's at least some hope that people would do that. Now, my view in terms of monthly testing is this. Uh, and, and bear in mind that when we write standards, we're not writing them just for local authority and social housing and, and high-rise blocks. We're, ask, we're writing them for, for little blocks, uh, whatever. whatever any, and, and in this case, it would be any block over 18 metres, which is only six storeys. And so the question is, uh, is it reasonable to send a managing agent from one side of London to the other to test uh, a switch, which almost certainly will not fail when you test it uh, every week. But here's the point. They should be going across London metaphorically to test the emergency lighting every month. Uh, and that is a reasonable thing to do. It's, it's, it, it's an essential thing to do. So when they're doing the monthly testing of the emergency lighting, it would make sense for them to do a test of the firefighting switch. Now, your question would probably be, sir, well then, why did you not say that in PAS 79 or the LGA guide? And the answer is, you're not allowed to write into one British standard something that conflicts with another British standard, even if what the other British standard says is stupid. Um, uh, or, that's unfair, unduly onerous. Um, and so we had to write it into PAS 79, and um, if we'd written the LGA guide uh, and we'd said every month, um, uh, I'd be sitting here and you'd be saying, who, who were you to change the British standard to every month? Uh, but there's a, a, more of a recognition now, sir, that, that, that testing things in blocks of flats every week is probably unreasonable. Very quick, I promise, another analogy. Um, smoke control systems, the interface with fire detection, uh, the, the new standard on that subject, BS 7273 Part 6, says the interface between detection and smoke control systems should be tested every week. But it goes on to say, but not in blocks of flats, for the very reason I've explained. And it basically says in blocks of flats, you can do it instead every month. And the thinking behind that is exactly uh, as I've described. And to bottom the point out, I promise this is my last point, uh, the Home Office have a consultation out at the moment. Uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, the consultation is closed and is under consideration by the Home Office. But the Home Office proposal is to make it a legal requirement to test firefighting lift switches uh, regularly, uh, and that's in response to the Chairman's recommendations. And the Home Office proposal is that the period should be every month in recognition of the fact that that's, that's actually what's reasonable. Um, Mr. Todd, looking at 8126 yes. on the screen there, uh, it says in terms, in the second line, this will involve weekly operation of the of override switches. Yes. Uh, uh, I, if that wasn't genuinely intended as part of the LGI guide, uh, why did you put it in? I thought I'd just explained that, sir. With so you put respect. it in? Bec even though, in fact, you didn't expect it to be complied with because you thought it was unreasonable? Um, 
I, we thought it was ex unduly onerous whether people would comply with it or not, but it wouldn't have been appropriate in the LGA guide, again, to conflict with the British standard. What needs changed is, is the British standard or, or the legal requirement. But um, I, I do not believe for one minute there's a need to test that switch every week. And, and my view would be every month, as now proposed by the Home Office in the last proposal uh, that went for public consultation, it would be perfectly reasonable. Right. Um, so, is your um, opinion <coughs> that 8126 in the second, second sentence? where it says this will involve weekly operation of overrides, which is, didn't need to be observed. Uh, that, that is my view, yes, sir. Even though this was a standard that you, yourself, or your organisation, uh, drafted. Or drafted. <laughs> yes, sir, that's oh, right. Okay. It's, it, it, it's on the, uh, it errs on the side of caution, uh, but <clears throat> while it was in the British standard, it wouldn't have been appropriate for us to, to right. change it. It would have just been confusing for people. Did you have any discussions with the DCLG or the unit in the DCLG who sponsored this uh, document about going back to the British standard, the BSI, and getting them to change the standards rather than trotting out something that you thought didn't need to be and wouldn't be complied with? Um, no, I don't, think, I don't think we actually did. I, I, don't, I, I very much doubt BSI would have jumped to issuing an amendment uh, immediately. They might well have said, next time we do a revision, we'll give it some thought. Uh, but the, the EN said, the EN was less definitive. It said regularly, brackets typically every week. So the EN was, was less definitive than the, the, the BS. Uh, and uh, I still maintain monthlies. And, and in fact, I think in PAS 79 Part 2, we actually uh, have changed it to monthly, but I can't just remember. Yeah. Now, can we look uh, back, please, at 882 of your main report on page 89 again? Uh, page 89 of your main report, paragraph 8.82. Uh, you say, I attach greater significance to Mr. Stokes's change of, word, change of the word testing to the word inspection. Yes. Fire safety, and I would suggest the field of engineering generally, there's a distinction between inspecting and testing. Indeed, the common use of the phrase inspection and testing underlines the distinction between the two activities. By analogy, a dry and rising main should be inspected every six months, but should be subject to a test involving charging of the main with water on an annual basis. Yes, sir. Now, um, concerning f fire lifts or fire fighting lifts, in what ways would inspection differ from testing? As with anything, uh, testing means that you perform the operation of the device to see if it works. Uh, inspection, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, you could look at it. I can't see there's a lot of... Well, there is a, a point in it, I suppose. You could check that it, there was no sign of, of damage. But uh, to me, uh, monthly inspection is not the same as, as monthly testing. But whether that was loose language or not, I'm not very clear. Uh, and it would appear from Mr. Stokes' evidence, uh, or rather his supplementary statement, that he meant testing and he was, he would say, aware that it was being tested every month. So I may have done him a disservice by being a bit too pedantic uh, in terms of the technical language, but um, it, it you would have to accept his evidence uh, as you will uh, or not as to <coughs> what he meant and what he thought was actually being carried out. On the assumption, that, uh, let's make this assumption, that Mr Stokes meant inspection, i.e. looking at it, rather than testing it, i.e. Yes. operating it, um, how could um, diluting the past guidance that we've looked at be consistent with competence? Well, if he, if he meant inspection... And, and he wasn't suggesting any routine testing, uh, then um, it, it, uh, that, that would be inappropriate. Uh, he, he, he wouldn't, that would have been wrong of him to do that. But it wasn't clear what he meant, and he appears to have clarified. I've dealt with this in my supplementary report, sir, uh, where I said it would appear that I did him a disservice because yeah. 
he was talking about monthly testing. Yeah. Well, let's look at that. Um, can we go to that? Yes, please. Let's raise it. Uh, at page 12. It says, this is CTA uh, 6038, page 12. And I think I'm right that uh, you mentioned this disservice you think you've done in the paragraph 512. Um, you say, if the public inquiry accepts the evidence in Mr. Kalan's witness statement, I may have done Mr. Stokes a disservice, to which I now draw attention. Uh, in this connection, Mr. Kalan states that the RBKC maintenance contractor ILS and not presumably specialist lift engineers checked all RBKC lifts every month and that this check did indeed, as expected by Mr. Stokes, include use of the standard drop key. Uh, why, why would Mr. Kalan's evidence that there was monthly use of the drop key by the maintenance contractor obviate the need for Mr. Stokes to satisfy himself that there was weekly and monthly, there was a weekly and monthly testing regime in place for the lifts? Well, I think in that, uh, could we go back to uh, Mr. Stokes' risk assessment, where uh, in effect he was by virtue of ticking a box, making a statement, if I can put it that way. Could, could we just see that again, sir? Uh, yes, which, which particular fire risk assessment would you like me to show Well, the, the, one, the one you showed me, uh, or, or any of them that dealt with that particular item. I think they all did. Let, let's look at the, yeah, anyone, look at the June 2016, CST 403145. Uh, and if we go in this document to uh, You'll forgive me for a moment while I try and find it for you. Thank you, sir. It's in the, the sort of tick box it past is. 79, it's in but it, it, it will be towards the end, sir, where we come to testing and maintenance. It, that's exactly right. And uh, you've asked me a question. I'm taking my time to answer it for you. Testing and maintenance is at 23, at page 32. Let's try page 32. Thank you. Is that what you want? Yeah, here we go. Is that what you want? Yeah, that's it, exactly, sir. Right. So, so by virtue of ticking the box, he's making a statement. He is saying, yes, monthly inspections of switches and annual testing of evacuation lifts, uh, that, that work is carried out. Now, I felt the reason I criticised his risk assessment was that, mm. to me, monthly inspection is not the same as monthly testing. Mm. But then Mr. Killarn says, well, actually, monthly testing was carried out, uh, and therefore um, <coughs> it, this, this inspection that Mr. Stokes is talking about uh, appears to actually have been a monthly test. I was also doubtful because I think Mr. Stokes, in his statement, said it was carried out by lift engineers, and I couldn't imagine lift engineers coming every month. But then Mr. Killarn said it wasn't actually lift engineers, it was just their general maintenance contractor who was doing monthly maintenance checks and that, that use of the drop key was part of that. Uh, so it would appear to me that this inspection Mr. Stokes was talking about that he apparently knew about was actually the testing that I would have wanted. I follow. But um, use of the drop key... Which yes. is what this, this is what this is the, Mr. Kalam was talking about. It's yes. not testing the lifts. It's simply one lift function, isn't it? Uh, yes, but that it's it, it's the uh, it's the override key that you 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 want to do the test of. Mm. I mean, I mean, you, you wouldn't normally uh, test that the the peekaboo facility works and then take it to another floor, check that the peekaboo uh, works on that floor. The the weekly testing is really of this switch. Yes, that's not testing of the lifts in their entirety, is it? No, it's not. No, uh, it's only one lift function, isn't it? Correct. So uh, uh, you can't spell 
from the fact uh, out from the fact that the the drop key was tested weekly, the, the the fact that the lifts were tested weekly. No, but the function of that regular test was to test the override switch, the 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 fireman switch, and the way you do that is with the drop key. Uh, yes. Um, so what I would expect them to do is operate the drop key, make sure the lift grounds, make sure the doors are open. And it's, it's, you're not testing the whole of the lift control mechanism, you're testing a switch because it's a fallible device. Yeah, so, so it's a limited weekly test. Yes. Right, um, but not a complete weekly test as per PAS 79 and L the LGA guide. I'm not sure that's what they meant. Could, I, I'm sorry to do this to you, but I, I need to see the words again. But, but the, the intent was the switch. The intent of what? The intent of the LGA guide and, and PAS 79. Oh, oh, was it? Well, let's, let's, um, let's look at the words again. I think it's important because word, words matter. Let's go back to the LGA guide then at HOM 3045964, page 125, paragraph 8126. Yes, you see there it says weekly test, weekly operation of the override switch. That's the override switch is just another name for the the fireman switch, which is another name for the firefighter switch. I see. Uh, so you say that the weekly test, weekly operation of the override switches was essentially the week a weekly test of the lift as a whole for this purpose. Did you say it was or wasn't? Was. No, I said it was the weekly test was a, a test of the switch, not of the lift as a whole. It says it says that this this will involve weekly test operation of the override switch. Now let's um, let's uh, look at the checking that was done. Can we go back to your statement, please? Uh, uh, and look at 886, please, on page uh, 90. And here you identify Mr Stokes's reliance on his uh, understanding that the TMO's estate service assistance, or ESAs, checked the fire control switch. Yes. Now, we've heard evidence now from Mr Stedman, Paul Stedman, who was an ESA. He confirmed that they never tested the fire control switch, at least in the lifts at Grenfell Tower. And for our record, that's day 146, page 70, lines 20 to 22. Well, that, that's no surprise, sir. Would you agree that Mr Stokes was required to understand the routine inspections and tests on the lifts at Grenfell Tower? Yeah, yes. Yes. And to understand both who was undertaking those tests and inspections and also the scope of those tests and inspections? Well, he certainly was required to, to verify that someone was... And would a competent fire risk assessor ask about those matters if they were going to rely on it in their fire risk assessment? Y yes, they would. Mm. They, they, they would ask, are you testing the, the, the lift switch? Uh, and inevitably, they, they wouldn't leave it. They will, yes, somebody tests it without understanding who. And, and would you agree that given Mr Stokes's reliance on unverified information about the ESA's lift inspections, his fire risk assessments uh, were deficient? No, because his fire, this, it was in his evidence he said it would be checked by the ESAs, but in his fire risk assessment, he, he simply says it was checked. He didn't say by whom. Yes, but uh, if, he, if in fact he was relying on the, uh, what he understood to be a check by the ESAs in saying they were checked in his fire risk assessments, but in fact hadn't asked the questions, would his fire risk assessment not be deficient? If... <laughs> if he misunderstood how it was tested, then I would tend to agree. If he knew it was tested, then I would tend to, to disagree. And I'm not sure what his basis was for, for the statement, to be honest. He seemed to be, it was almost as though he, was, he had several lines of defence in giving evidence, <laughs> uh, uh, some of which... Um, I think we're possibly with the benefit of hindsight. 
Well, that's... Um, but that's perhaps being unfair to him. That's for the chairman to decide, well, of it's, course. It's interesting to hear your view, but I think probably not a matter for your expert opinion. No, indeed. Like my I, question... I, I, I absolutely agree, and I withdraw the comment if it's inappropriate, chairman. Yeah. Right. No, don't worry. My, I, I, you'll be forgiven. But my, my question was, was about your expert opinion, and I'll just put it again. Would, would you agree that given his reliance on unverified information about the ins lift inspections by, the, by anybody, but the ESA in particular... Do you, do you agree that his fire risk assessments were deficient in that respect? I'd like to help you with that, sir, but I can't, I can't really uh, agree with you because if we go up to 885, we see that Mr Stokes also states that he would have made sure that there were records of monthly inspections of the lifts by competent lift engineers. Now... It wasn't lift engineers, it would appear from Mr. Killarn, it was maintenance engineers. Uh, and, and therefore, it would appear that he had some knowledge, but it's very unclear as to its source. It would appear that he, he had some knowledge that it was tested every month, and the statement in his risk assessment that it was tested every month appears consistent with the evidence of Mr. Killarn, which is a matter for evidence of fact, of course. So the statement he made wasn't wrong, sir. So uh, it would appear. Well, I think we probably exhausted that topic. Can I just then ask you to look at your supplemental report, uh, CS, sorry, CTA 6038, page 12, paragraph 510? Yes. Um, here you say... I draw attention to Mr. Kalan's distinction between the refurbishment, you underline that word, yes. these lifts that was carried out as opposed to the replacement of the lifts as occurred in the case of the hydraulic lift. In my opinion, this is a very important distinction, particularly in relation to any suggestion that the lifts should at the time in question have been upgraded to firefighting lifts. Um, why is that distinction important for considering the adequacy of Mr. Stokes's fire risk assessment? Um, can I just put this in context by reading the whole thing? Yes, of course. Can you just go up a little bit for me, please, sir? We scroll up to the page, um, the top of the page. The, the top of the page, thank you, yes. I think this was just, uh, it, was, it wasn't so much uh, in relation to the adequacy of Mr Stokes' risk assessment. It was more really that um, I just wanted to, to draw attention to uh, a, a relevant uh, piece of evidence. It wasn't, it wasn't anything stronger than that. I see. So this isn't actually an opinion about Mr Stokes' assessment? No, no, not, 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 not really, sir. Right. Um, can we then turn to a different topic altogether, which is doors, the, yeah. it, the flat entrance doors? Before leaving that topic, could I just make one other point, sir? Yes. Had, had Mr Stokes realised it was a fireman's lift uh, rather than a firefighting lift, it begs the question, what would a competent risk assessor have said about that or done about it? And all they would have done was included as narrative that it was a fireman's lift but they most certainly wouldn't have included a recommendation in the action plan that steps be taken to upgrade it uh, to firefighting lift standard. That would be outside the scope of the risk assessment and disproportionate. Um, the most that might have been said was, if you ever come to refurbish it, do think about whether you can upgrade it. But it wouldn't have been recommending it wouldn't have triggered a recommendation for upgrading. I just wanted to make that clear, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, now, um, doors. <laughs> yes. I want to start with the topic of FD30, FD30S doors or door sets. Yes. Now, now there has been um, quite a bit of discussion in this module about flat entrance doors and the classification of those doors. I see. Uh, in relation to the applicable standard. Uh, could, you please, could you briefly explain to us the characteristics ne necessary for a door set to qualify as FD30? FD30. So it would have to be uh, a door set, as you correctly describe it, that would pass 
the current fire resistance test for doors. Now, you've got two options in that respect. You've got BS476 uh, Part 22, and then you've got the BSEN on fire resistance testing. Uh, and you can use either. Uh, they won't necessarily give you quite the same result, but either would be acceptable. Um, and in that test, it would meet the criteria for fire resistance for a period of 30 minutes. And there are three possible criteria that you probably don't want the detail of. Right. Um, and how does that specification differ for FD30S? Okay, so an FD30S door is a door that meets the same fire resistance standard, but in addition has a smoke seal fitted to it. Think of that as something very akin to a draft seal, and that will then be tested uh, in accordance with 476.31.1, uh, which is the test for smoke seals. And, and it's really it's, it's actually tested more like a draft seal because it uses air. Right. And the smoke seal fitted is in the door or, or in the door Either. set? Either the door or the frame. Oh, I see. But the, is the door frame tested for fire resistance? You, no, you test the door. The you the you door. used the word correctly, sir, when you said door set. And a door set is the door and the frame and the furniture. Yes, that's right. Uh, but the fire resistance test, am I right in thinking, applies to the leaf of the door only? No, you test the, uh, you test the, the test fire the resistance thing. as a door set. Right, I see. Uh, so the only difference then between FD30 and FD30S is the addition, either on the door jam or the leaf of the door, of a smoke seal. Exactly so. Right. Uh, and... T tell me about the relevance of BS 476 Part 31.1. That was the testing for uh, smoke leakage. Cold smoke leakage. Correct. And uh, how is that relevant to whether it's an FD30 door or an FD30S door? Because the, effectively it's testing the performance of the smoke seal. Got it. Thank you. So what you do is you pressurise the, the chamber... Um, to, uh, I think it's three different pressures you can use, uh, and then you look at, at the leakage. So that's why I said it's tested a little bit like a draft, it, almost as though it's a draft seal. It's, mm. it's holding back the air, and therefore will hold back mm. smoke. Yes, and so an, to be an FD30S door, is this right, if I got this right, that it is a door set, which yes. has not only been tested and passed the fire resistance tests under BS476 Part 22, Yes but also has a, a cold smoke seal fitted to it and been tested as a door set to BS 476 part 31.1 for ambient or cold smoke leakage. That would be correct, sir. Yes. Thank you. And, and to, be, to be clear then, you, you can't just take, in order to be a 30S door, you can't just take an FD30 door, fit seals to the door or the frame, and then say, voila, it's an FD30S door. And hope for, hope for the best. Um, you, that, that, that is sometimes what, what people do on a pragmatic basis because uh, you wouldn't be sure that you've actually achieved the performance of the British standard, but you'd know it'd be better than it was before. Right, but it wouldn't be a 30, an FD30S door because it had not been tested. No, you would, in, the, in the LGA guide, we uh, define three different types of door. Are you going on to that, sir? Uh... Maybe not today, but possibly. Um, Very quickly. OK. Uh, so we, we talk about three different types of door in the LGA guide. We talk about an, an FD30S door, and that is, if I can use the term, the full Monty that you've just described. At the other extreme, we talk about a notional FD30 door. And what we mean by that is a door that met the standard for 30 minutes fire resistance at the time the door was manufactured or the block was built. And standards have changed over the years. So an original door back in the 60s or 70s that was rated at 30 minutes to the, the fire resistance test prior to 1972 or that met the GLC specification for doors, if you tested that to today's standard, you would probably struggle to get 
20 minutes fire resistance. You'd probably get something between 15 and 20 minutes fire resistance. So, but these doors we know perform perfectly well in real fires. It's just that the test has changed. So under, certain, under most circumstances, we actually said these notional doors could remain. So we've got the FD30S at one end, the notional door at the other end, and we said under some circumstances, there might be a halfway house where you could make the door better by fitting a smoke seal and intumescent strip, not just the smoke seal, sir. Um, and then it will perform better than it did before. You couldn't say hand on heart, you'd get FD30S performance. You'd just know that you get something better than the old notional FD30. So this is to say, this, I think what you've just identified for us is the three options. Yes. Uh, and we'll, I think we do come to that when we come to see Mr Stokes's uh, letter. Yes, I thought uh, you might, sir. Uh, yes, so let's go to that then. Um, could we go, please, to CST 402660? This um, is a letter sent by Carl Stokes to Janice Ray on the 10th of November 2010. Uh, and if you uh, look at the title, it's Criteria for Prioritising the Fitting of New Entrance Doors to Flats. Uh, and then there are eight criteria set out there. And then uh, he says, under options, can you see options? I do. There are three of them. Um, one, replace the old door and frame, the door set with new 30-minute fire-rated door set, incorporating intumescent strips and cold smoke seals, FD30S, yes. with a self-closing device. And yes. then over the page, two, replace the old door with a new 30-minute fire-rated door inserted in the old frame, incorporating intumescent strips and cold smoke seals in the new door, FD30S, with a self-closing device, and then three, fit intumescent strips, if not fitted, and cold smoke seals in the existing door and a self-closing device to the door. Now, d d did uh, Mr Stokes correctly advise that the specification of those replacement doors under the first two options uh, would be, or should be, FD30S? If you replaced an old door with a new leaf in the old frame... Uh, you couldn't be absolutely sure that uh, you'd get FD30S, but you, you could make an assessment, or a, a competent person could probably make an assessment, uh, that it would be something very, very close to it. Um, uh, so he, he he's not actually defining the same three. Could you go back to the first one again? Yes, of course. Could the bottom of page two, please, can we have that? Replace the old door and frame with a new FD30S. So, so I'm just trying to think what these are options for. It was dealing with flat entrance doors. So the first option is the first option that I described, sir. I, yes. And I, I, uh, the, the, what I called the full Monty, if you yes. like. Uh, he doesn't actually countenance my notional FD30. Could, could we turn to the next page? He doesn't actually countenance uh, doors, leaving doors, not having uh, strips and seals. Uh, so his three is my middle one, and his two <laughs> is, is something between my middle one and my first one. Would it be correct to describe his two as FD30S? Mm, you, couldn't, you couldn't be sure of that because it had not been tested. Correct. Mm. Uh, now, can we go to uh, CST 3013074, please? This is a letter dated the 7th of March 2011, uh, which Mr Stokes updated on the 10th of March 2011, some days later, after a meeting with Simon Thropp uh, on that day, as you can see. Uh, and the subject is replacement of entrance doors to some residential apartments. And uh, he says uh, in the third paragraph down, on the Mance Master Door Limited Company website, it states that their doors meet the requirements of Part M of the building regulations and fire check versions have also been successfully tested to BS 476 Part 22. Can it please be confirmed that the doors are to be fitted under the contract are the 30-minute fire doors, FD30 version, and could the company forward all the relevant documentation to confirm this? In the specifications and information, there appears to be no mention of self-closing devices being fitted to the apartment entrance doors, nor 
that the doors will have intumescent seals. Um, now, should Mr Stokes, in your opinion, have asked for confirmation that the doors were FD30S? Yes, that, that would have been appropriate, yep. Yes. The you only see. thing I would say is, in practice, uh, a manufacturer of a door that was giving you a 30-minute door intended as a flat entrance door would, would know that you wouldn't want an FD30 without the smoke seal. Everyone would know that. Now, there's no e evidence we've seen uh, that Mr Stokes insisted that the doors or door sets were certified FD30S. Right. Well, uh, uh, would, would you have expected Mr Stokes to have raised that with the TMO and, and said you need to make sure that that gets certified as an FD30S door set? Yes, that, if, if you're fitting a new door and you're paying, you're going to the trouble of fitting a new door, um, you would want the new door to be FD30S. Mm. Now, if you go to CST50 is 991, please, you can see that uh, after the fitting of the first Mance Master Door door, Mr Stokes writes to Janice Ray on the 23rd of, of May 2011, as you can see from what's on the screen, subject the fitting of the first replacement entrance door to flat 16 Grenfell Tower. Thank you for inviting me, he writes, to view the installation of the first re replacement entrance door to flat 16 of Grenfell Tower on the 11th of May. My comments are limited to that of the fire requirements needed to be compliant with the Fire Safety Order 2005 from the information given to me by the installation team on site and the technical sheets beforehand by yourselves. The door fitted was a fire rated version FD30 of the shore door GRP range, etc. And then it goes on to the next uh, a little bit lower down, uh, to say that the door was fitted with a self-closing device, intumescent and cold smoke seals, and a fire-rated letterbox, uh, all in accordance with the details supplied beforehand. The door set has been, according to the manufacturer's information, been successfully tested to BS476 Part 22. Uh, and then he goes on a bit lower down in the next paragraph to say, from the technical information given to me and what I observed... <coughs> during the on-site visit, I have no adverse comments to make. Now, in oral evidence, when he was taken to this document, Mr Stokes appeared to suggest that he was seeking confirmation that the doors installed were certified as FD30. Uh, and I want just to show you what he said in the few minutes that remain this afternoon. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, can we please go to day 138 at page 54? <coughs> Uh, and if we go to line 20 on page 54, um, he's shown this letter and then asked at line 20, so after the trial door installation, it seems that you provided your opinion on whether the door or doors complied with the requirements of the fire safety order and approved document B, yes? Answer, correct. Question, and you confirmed that they were FD30, yes? Answer, top of page 55, line 1. From the information I was given... Yes. And that w question, and that was contrary to your advice, wasn't it, of the requirements for the doors which you gave before the installation, which was that at least according to the parts of ADB that you highlighted in green, they should be FD30S. Answer, I disagree. The doors are FD30, as it says in this document. The, so it says here, the door fitted was an FD30. Then it says there is fitted reinforced frame. The door was fitted with self-closing device, intumescent and smoke cold smoke seals, so therefore that makes it the S. Now, uh, in effect, well, one can read the transcript, but Mr Stokes is explaining why he considers his note that the door installed an FD30 was not contrary to his earlier uh, advice that it needed to be FD30S. Is his, is his explanation correct, in your opinion? Uh, technically not. In what way? Well... First of all, we can dispense with the reference to the self-closing device and the intumescent because that's nothing to do with the S. Um, so what he's saying is, I saw a cold smoke seal, so that makes it an S. Uh, and, and that's that. he's making something of an assumption um, to be ridiculous about it. Someone could have gone down to B&Q and bought a, a, a draft excluder and stuck it on, uh, and it would have looked like a smoke seal, but it wouldn't make it an FD30S. Right. So, it, 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 just being specific, when he says at line 7 to 12 on that page, 
um, that the door being fitted with cold smoke seals makes it the S. Is that right or wrong? It, the chances are it does, but you can't be sure. I, so you say chances are it makes it S because it, it might have the effect. It, it might pass a, a, um, a BS476 part 31.1 test. It might not. Correct. And someone, right. someone's gone to the bother of fitting the smoke seal. So he, he, he's made the assumption they wouldn't have done that. Uh, and then sold the door unless mm. it had been tested as an FD30S. But that, there, is, there is an assumption there, uh, and, and you can't say that categorically. Right. Would you know whether the seal had been fitted by the manufacturer or not? I mean... Depends, depends on the door. Um, these, these, were, these were composite doors. Yes. Um, they tend... The, 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 the strip and seal tend to come as a single component, uh, sir rather than two different bits. So you get a combined intumescent strip and smoke seal. Uh, and uh, the probably, I mean, this is the assumption that the manufacturer would have fitted uh, a, a combined intumescent strip and smoke seal that they knew would perform correctly. Um, but sometimes, he, it depends on the, the make of the door, sometimes the, the smoke seal is, is sort of, sorry, the intumescent is kind of flushed in uh, and, and is the same colour as the door and it's difficult to see, so it looks like a smoke seal without an intumescent. Uh, so it depends what component they've used, sir. I mean, what, of course, it ultimately, it's for us, the panel, to decide what, what was fitted on these doors. But it seems slightly surprising, one might think, is that the smoke seal and intumescent would not have been fitted by the manufacturer of the yeah, doors. Well, the manufacturer. Yeah, for those for those doors, uh, for those doors, they would have been. I would have expected them to have been. It would come as as a door set uh, right. from from the manufacturer. Yeah. Um, yes, but yes, think, uh, if it's a timber door, you might just route it and fit the intumescent strip. Right. Well, it might raise the same question as to who would have done that and when, but, I, yeah. but these weren't timber doors. So no, I know. We're not worried. No, they weren't. Uh, would you ca characterise Mr Stokes' advice uh, that by adding uh, the smoke, cold smoke seals, that makes it an S, uh, as you say it's incorrect, potentially incorrect, um, did that fall below the standards of competence customary in the trade? <laughs> Um, I, I, I think he was just being pragmatic and, and assumed that no one would have sold them uh, uh, a door with a, uh, a strip and seal unless it was an FD30S. And in the vast, well, in the vast majority of cases, notwithstanding there were problems with those man's master doors, it, that would be correct. It, I think it was just pragmatism. Given that he'd taken it upon himself to spell out to the TMA what was required. Oh yes, he, if, uh, he did. Yeah. Given that he'd done that, was his was his advice um, competent or, or up to the standards of competence customary in the trade? I think it would be a reasonable assumption for him to make, sir. Yes. A reasonable assumption. What? That, the that door it was. Set had been that tested. he saw he saw a new composite door. It had been sold as a flat entrance door. It came fitted with an intumescent strip and smoke seal. It would be a reasonable assumption that the door provided would be an FD30S. And that means, does it, that it was a reasonable assumption on his part, in your opinion, that it had been tested to BS 476 part 31.1? Yes, that the, the, the seal, that the manufacturer knew that the seal would perform, yeah. Can, that, can you just clarify something? This may sound a silly question. You I'm obviously... Sure you obviously can't do a fire-resistant test on a new door because no. <laughs> it wouldn't destroy the door. Exactly. As far as the smoke seals are concerned, um, again, do you test the prototype, if that's the right word? Yes. You, you, the, the doors are tight-tested. Exactly. Uh, uh, or the, the seal. Uh, it, you can get the seals and... and, and uh, the, the seal will have performed in, in like doors. So... so when, you, when the test body does the assessment, um, there are certain... Uh, you, you can't have it exactly the same as the, the model tested, so there are certain uh, changes you can make that the test house put in the, uh, the, yeah. the, the global assessment that, that indicates that the door will still perform. But my, the point I want us to clarify is 
the door that's fitted to my flat, yes. I'm a tenant, has not itself been tested. No. It is simply reflects a test on a type. Yes, yeah. yeah. Much the same as your BMW hasn't been individually tested by, uh, you know, whoever certificates vehicles for sale and, and, and the, the uh, construction of, and use regulations or whatever they are. Uh, it will have been type tested and then you, you trust okay. that BMW are turning out more BMWs the same. That, that is what I thought, but I just thought we better... No, no, um, that, that wasn't a silly question, sir. Uh, yes, uh, uh, one final question, if I may, Mr Chairman, noting the time. Yeah. Um, Given that the manufacturer itself did not say that these doors were fire rated, if you like, to FD30S, why was it a reasonable assumption on the part of Mr Stokes that they were? Um, simply because of the, if I can call it again, telltale signs. It came with a fire rated letterbox. It was sold presumably as a flat entrance door. I think that, that particular product was intended as a flat entrance door. It was absolutely universally known in the, the industry that a, flat en a new flat entrance door had to be FD30S. So the chances are, the chances of someone selling them a door that would not perform uh, with a seal that they, they, they knew would perform correctly, uh, the chances of that, that happening would be, or should be, very slim. Well, supposing the manufacturer uh, had submitted the door set to a uh, BS 476 part 31.1 test and it had failed, and had decided to, manu to, to market the, the door as an FD30, uh, the assumption that it was an FD30S would be wholly misplaced, wouldn't it? It, it would, but that would be a strange thing for a manufacturer to do if he was selling it as a flat entrance door, knowing that flat entrance doors need to be FD30S. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr Chairman, uh, clearly it's, an, it's a more than convenient moment for the end yes. of the day, um, and therefore I would invite us to stop there. Yes. Well, Mr Todd, we slightly overrun the usual witching hour, but that isn't a problem. Um, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to come back again tomorrow for some more questions. But yes, you, sir, I gathered. I think you probably had that in your programme anyway, didn't you? Um, I had it as a fallback. And well, I have a contingency plan for getting clothes. Well, um, I'm sorry we're going to have to fall back because we haven't got it finished. So we'll break now. We'll resume uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, please. Thank you, sir. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Oh, and the usual request, please don't talk to yes, anyone sir. about your evidence of overnight. Course. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mr. Millett. Uh, Ten o'clock tomorrow.